Well, you're at home, scrolling through the feed, watching some videos, when… oh, the power goes out. No big deal, phone's still working until the battery runs out, but sooner or later, you'll wonder. Why won't the toilet flush with the electricity out? It's not like commodes are plugged into an outlet right there in the bathroom wall. When you pull the flush handle, a large flow of water rushes from the tank into the bowl. It works just by the force of gravity, if your house has a gravity-fed waste removal system. While gravity is always at our service, unless your toilet's in space, there's one problem with no power. The tank doesn't get filled. The quick solution? Flush the bowl manually by pouring a bucket of water into it. When the power comes back, the water will fill the tank again. You'll probably be in more of a pickle if your water removal system is powered by electricity. With this system, the waste goes through the pipes and gathers in a chamber. It needs an electric pump to transfer it into the sewer. So, if you don't want to find yourself in an embarrassing situation, consider getting an emergency generator. The way your plumbing works also depends on your water source and where you live. If you're in a private house, you'll have water, but it'll flow at a lower pressure. It'll last as long as the city water tower doesn't run out. Similar thing if you use well water. You'll have some time to finish your business while using water left in the reservoir. Filling up a cistern requires a pump, and that's run on, yep, electricity, unfortunately. And if you live in an apartment complex, the water will stop right after the outage. Most high-rises get water up to each apartment thanks to pumps in the basement. And you know about the problems with electric-driven pumps by now. The plumbing system in high-rises is so complicated, there are even legends about it. One of them says if all the toilets were flushed at the same time, it could take down the building. It actually won't do anything because skyscrapers don't rely on one plumbing system. It's divided into multiple zones that serve certain parts, and the stress is spread among them. Another myth about toilets is that the water in the bowl swirls the other way in Australia because of the Coriolis effect. Hmm. This does affect how air moves, so hurricanes spin counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. But the Coriolis effect is too weak to have any impact on your bathroom. The direction of the flush depends only on the toilet's design. But back to power outages. Can you shower during them? Yes, but only if you use a traditional tank-style water heater. If the tank is full and the water is already hot, you're good to take a shower. But don't wait too long. Without power, the water will stay warm for only a couple of hours. And if the power is going to be out for a while, it's better to use water more sparingly. Some toilets don't even need water, at least not much of it. They use a vacuum instead, so the contents in the bowl go into the pipe with the force of suction. On airplanes, the high-pressure cabin air literally pushes the stuff down into the holding tank. Vacuum toilets use only a small amount of water and sanitizer that rinses and disinfects the bowl. It saves electricity, thus saving weight on planes, but it also depends on electricity. Using a restroom in space is a whole nother experience. Instead of a WC, astronauts use a WCS, which stands for Waste Collection System. To handle the waste in zero-g, a suction system is used to send it to a special container. After that, sophisticated equipment turns the liquid waste into, wait for it, drinkable water. Another astonishing engineering idea is to make toilets themselves an energy source. One industrial design student created a power generator that makes electricity from wastewater as it falls through the pipes. It works like a small hydroelectric dam inserted in a building's plumbing. The technology isn't meant for private homes, but could be useful in high-rise and commercial buildings. That might be the future, but let's quickly look at your toilet's long past. The earliest private latrines are at least 5,000 years old. Ancient civilizations would carry away waste using a stream of water. The ancient Romans were known for their surprisingly advanced sewage systems. Public latrines became places to socialize with others, which seems pretty bizarre when you think about it today. The forerunner to the modern flush toilet was invented in 1596 by Sir John Harrington, Queen Elizabeth I's godson. 
The design had a two-foot-deep oval bowl that was rinsed clean by water rushing from a cistern above. In the 1860s and 70s, Parisians could do their business without leaving the street. There were more than 1,200 open-air bathrooms around the city. Some of them were so pretty, they were considered works of art. You can still find the last of them on Boulevard Arago. In the 1880s, British manufacturer Thomas William Twyford introduced the first all-ceramic freestanding toilet. Back then, the bowls could be intricately designed and painted, not like the smooth, stark white ones we have today. The first successful lines of flush toilets were manufactured by Thomas Crapper. Yep. He didn't invent the commode, as many people believe, but he put all the best engineering ideas together and added some new improvements, like the tank-filling mechanism that's still used today. Each culture has its bathroom traditions, and sometimes it can be confusing when you travel to a different country. Many visitors can't figure out Japanese toilets because they're so high-tech. They have buttons to lift the lid, warm the seat, turn on the dryer or sprayer, play some music, and somewhere along all those buttons is the flusher. Don't forget to bring your own TP and hand sanitizer when visiting Cuba. You won't find these hot commodities in most public restrooms there. You better bring your wallet into the bathroom in Sweden. You have to pay to use the toilets in larger cities. The money goes into the restroom's upkeep and maintenance. There's also a theory that people take better care of the place after spending some money to get in. For obvious reasons, Antarctica doesn't have the type of sewage system we're used to. People working on the icy continent collect waste and burn it in incinerators. Now, I'm just guessing here that it would be worse to be icy and incontinent. You think? Did you notice how the doors of toilet stalls don't reach the floor? That space helps you see if the stall is occupied or in case the person inside needs emergency medical assistance. The shorter walls and doors have much better ventilation too, so lucky for us, smells dissipate faster. You won't find a lid on many public toilets either, just the seat. For one, most places don't keep them because they're prone to breaking, since we all use our feet to kick them open. Plus, for whatever reason, who knows, but some people like to take toilet lids from public restrooms. Hmm. Too bad, too, because it's better to put the lid down each time you flush. The reason? The dreaded toilet plume. Ooh. When you flush a toilet, the gurgling, swirling water sends microscopic particles of waste shooting up in the air, mixing with the air you breathe and covering all nearby surfaces. That includes the toilet paper holder, the bathroom countertop, the walls, the floor, and the ceiling. Hey, we're all germaphobes in public restrooms, yet nobody's pushing the elevator button with their foot. Strange, since there are 40 times more germs on that button than on a public toilet seat.